Greetings, everyone. Hope you have all enjoyed your day so far. And also, I want to thank you for taking time to tune into the show today, where we will be bringing forth and discussing liberal and free-thinking topics concerning the Bible, as well bringing you news and updates of different discussions taking place within the I.O. Preterist community. Speaking of, this is pretty much breaking news, Michael Beers is back in Facebook jail. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Beers is in Facebook jail once again, thanks to someone (laughs) who doesn't have a good sense of humor. So for those who, uh, you know, are friends with Michael Beers, be sure to send him some love, write him some letters while he's in jail, let him know that we miss him and that we are thinking about him. But uh, there was a there was actually a post in the Black Sheep group which says if I.O. is true, then only Israelites were created in the image and likeness of God, and all of us are just, and he used uh, a cuss word, which I'm not a big cusser, so I don't like saying cuss words, but he basically said we were cow manure. Uh, He used the S word, for those who are wondering, and he put LOL behind it. Now, what I want you to notice is, and the reason I want to talk about this real quick, is because religion, this, this is a guy who is caught up in religion. And he's basing his entire self-worth and value upon it. And he feels like if he doesn't have a connection to it, then he's worthless. And, of course, I.O. brings this message showing that, uh, you know, the Bible is clearly focused upon Israel and them only. That's who God had a covenant and relationship with. And he's seeing the points that are being brought up, and he's feeling left out. I don't know. Or he's, you know... I don't know, I'm not sure just how much these uh, these ideas from I.O. are affecting him, but clearly something inspired him to write this. So he sees the, he sees the emphasis and the uh, implications of I.O. if it is true. However, he's going down this road of losing self-worth and value because he's not a part of the biblical narrative, which is just wrong. For example, when a uh, baby is born, do you value that baby because it's a Christian? No, that baby is not even part of a religion. He is just born. But because that baby is a person, you value that. Because it's a precious being, we value that. That baby in itself has value and self-worth. And people need to understand that value and uh And worth does not come from an outer source. It doesn't come from religion. It doesn't come from uh, a relationship you're in. The value comes from you. You bring value to life. You bring value to your jobs. You bring value to even religion. Without Without you, religion has no value. Think about that. And something that kind of inspired me to keep on pressing on, I guess you could say, uh, because... I was to the point where I was willing to let the I.O. Uh, preterist discussions just die out. I wasn't going to really continue in them anymore. But, you know, this this uh, encounter I had with my daughter last night just inspired me to keep on going. So last night she wants to go to youth service. And for those who don't know, my family is religious. I myself am not. They still go to service, and I go every once in a while, but for the most part, I really backed away from going there, you know, just sitting there for a whole hour listening to some irrelevant message about salvation and redemption that was all for Israel, and today is for these spiritual people who claim to be a spiritual descendant of Abraham. However, she wanted to go to youth service, and I had just got off of work, and I was tired. I didn't feel like taking her. It was like a 30-minute drive to get there, and I just wasn't up to it, and neither was my wife. She wasn't feeling well. So I told her no, and you could tell her entire demeanor change, her entire demeanor change. And so I asked her, I said, were they doing something special tonight? That uh, Were they, were they doing something special, pretty much? And she said... No, but the youth leader has sent out a text to all the youth saying, if you want to go to the next level, be sure to be in service tonight. And for those who didn't make it, this next level was not meant for them. And, you know, it kind of took me back because you could tell that it was really affecting her. And I was like, wow. And so I told her, I said, honey, I wouldn't worry too much about his opinion. And I'm pretty sure all those who made it tonight 
are no closer to God than you are. Now, she might not have caught the full power of that statement, and maybe I'll explain it to her when she's older. However, this is a great example of what religious does to people, religion does to people, and why it should be exposed for the fraud that it is. No one should have to feel left out just because they didn't make it to one freaking youth service. No one. And but but because we got these wannabe teachers and prophets of God who don't know what the Bible they teach from is all about, uh, pitting themselves in authority over people's life, making people feel like they are God sent, you know, with a message from God. They know the intent and heartbeat of God. And if you're not at youth service tonight, God didn't have you in his plans. He already knew you wasn't going to be here. You know, this condescending type of talk to a youth, uh, a child who is 13, and I'm pretty sure there's other uh, age brackets within the youth group, but my daughter's 13. You know, this is just foolishness, and this is one reason I despise religion very much, and I'm glad I'm not a part of it. All right, uh, but in other news, there was a another post from a guy who brought up a couple of points speaking about the cursings and blessings of the nations who dealt with Israel. And he felt like Io was being inconsistent and not uh, emphasizing on the blessings of the other nations, which is fine. Uh, other nations were blessed because of Israel. That's fine. But it had to do with our direct dealings with Israel. And the point that I would emphasize is that Israel is no longer here on the planet. All Israel was saved when their deliverer came out of Zion. Christ gathered up his elect, took him into the kingdom, delivered it up to his father. There is no one dealing directly with uh, Israel today, so no one is being blessed or cursed because of them, according to the biblical narrative. And then, um, however, he brought up another point that... Uh, he says, when you look at the sheep and the goats, he sees three groups. He says the sheep are nations, the goats are nations, and then we have Christ's brothers. You know, basically there is some misunderstanding on his part pertaining to who the sheep and goats are. So here are a few things that, in my opinion, bring clarity to this matter. First, the separation of the sheep and goats, which only speak of two groups, is parallel with the harvest of the wheat and the tares that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 13. The wheat and the tares come from the same field. And the field is identified as the world. That's the same world that would end along with Jerusalem and his temple in the same generation of those Jesus was speaking with at the Olivet Discourse. And you can see this in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. And in the final passage, uh, you will see where he says, This generation shall not pass away, to all things be fulfilled, uh, from verse 34. Okay, the world or field that came to an end was Israel that lived under the law of Moses. They were judged and rewarded according to their deeds. That's the separation of the sheep and the goats, that judgment right there. Uh, and that happened when the Roman army came and destroyed their city and temple, along with those that placed their faith in the law rather than in Christ in AD 70, bringing an end to them and their temple worship and rituals. So... <clears throat> Uh, so that's something I want to clear up right there. And also, in other news, we might have awakened another one from the deception of religion. I had a friend of mine, uh, I was scrolling down my feeds, and a friend of mine was asking about death, pretty much what happens when we die. He said, if the kingdom is already here within us, what happens when we die? And I sent a comment, I said, we end up in a cemetery. And he said, I know what happens to the physical body, I'm asking... Uh, are we not going to go and live with God forever? And I told him the only ticket to heaven was the resurrection. And, of course, we both believed that that was past. And he said, so we're not dead in Christ? I said, no. I said, all that belong to Christ will be raised up at the last day. And I sent him John chapter 6, I think it was verse 38 through 40. And he sent back, well, he didn't send back, but he liked, he loved the comment. So, and we didn't continue after that, so we might have awoken another one from the deception of religion, and he might be fully on board. 
All right, but enough about that. That's just the side news. We're going to get right to the heart of the matter. The topic of the day is what is the Bible all about? Now, I believe the beginning of any story gives us a narrative or a guide for our line of thinking for the rest of the story. And the Bible in no way differs from that. The story in Genesis reveals the very focus of the Bible as well as the message behind it. Now, the normal take on the first three chapters in Genesis is that Adam and Eve, who are the first man and woman created by God, are placed in a garden and given a command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, yet due to a talking snake, they are deceived into breaking God's command and are cast out the garden to die. Seems legit enough, and many see this story as representing the fall of all mankind, placing all men in a sinful condition as Adam. Yet as you come to study and know the scriptures, you will come to see there is a strong parallel between the life of Adam and the story of Israel. Both Adam and Israel were chosen by God and given land, and as long as they followed the statutes and commandments of God, were allowed to remain in the land. Now this concept of Israel remaining in the land, as long as they follow God's law given by Moses, can be seen in passages like Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 40, which says, Thou shalt keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which Lord thy God giveth thee forever. All right? Then Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 33 Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. And finally, 1 Kings chapter 9, starting at verse 6, But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye are your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods, and worship them. Then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. And this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. Now do you see how Israel would prolong their days upon the land as long as they obeyed the law of God? As we know, Israel did not keep God's commands and were eventually exiled from the land and taken into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. You can see this in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 17, which says, Israel is scattered is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria has devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. Israel was cast off the land for breaking God's command. Which is very similar to Adam, who remained in the garden until he broke God's command. Now many may consider this to just be random events taking place in one man's life, and God later manipulating Israel's history to follow these patterns, yet I don't see that to be the case. I believe it is no coincidence that the story of Adam is very similar to that of Israel throughout Scripture. Just consider where these following four points would naturally lead us. 1. The forming and creating of man, who we know as Adam, from clay is parallel to that of Isaiah's writing of God forming and creating of Israel, which is portrayed as clay in the hands of the potter. All right, point two. Adam is placed in a garden. Israel is given Canaan, the promised land. And point three, Adam receives a command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil as a stipulation for remaining in the garden. And Israel remains in the promised land as long as they obey the law of Moses. And point four, Adam and Eve disobey and are exiled from the garden. Israel persists in a pattern of disobedience and are exiled from the promised land into captivity. Now these parallels are undeniable, leading to the conclusion for me that Adam's story is a representation of Israel in the land given them. And if that is true, which it seems very reasonable to believe so, then the beginning of the Bible is revealing to us a narrative focused upon Israel, the chosen seed of Abraham, who was given the promised land, and is describing their fall from the law of God resulting in them being exiled from the land. Now this concept as well can be seen in the New Testament throughout Paul's letters, that of Adam personifying or representing Israel. For example, notice what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll start at verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. 
and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. When we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this is pretty cool, because we see Paul speaking to the new covenant saints, as bearing the image of Adam, who would soon bear the image of Christ. As you know, an image is a representation of something, and just as Adam represented one state of Israel, so would Christ, who image they would bear. Paul continues to allude to this transformation from Adam to Christ in his letters. For example, in both the book of Ephesians and Colossians, notice, notice what he says. Uh, we'll look at Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The next passage comes from Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So what exactly are we seeing? Well, we see the story of Adam representing Israel and their history throughout the scriptures. Both were given a land and a law to keep, and due to breaking that command, they are cast out the land to die. Then we see Paul speaking of the new covenant saints as bearing the image of Adam, the old man, who would later bear the image of Christ, the new man. Now here is something that really drives this point home. Just as God created man, uh, who we know as Adam, in the garden, through Christ a new man was being made between the Jews, those of Judah, and Ephraim, those of Israel scattered amongst the heathens. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in himself a twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now clearly the new man was an allegory or a personification of the first century saints. It wasn't a literal man. Just as the first Adam, the old man, was an allegory or personification for the old covenant saints. The conclusion of the matter is both were personifications telling a story about God's chosen people Israel from beginning to end, showing us Israel's transformation from the old man Adam into the new man Christ, the last Adam. And that, my friend, is what the Bible is all about. Well, that is it for me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Hope you all enjoyed. And if you did enjoy the show, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And whenever a new video is out, you will receive an alert letting you know. And until next time, take care, be safe, and continue to share truth in love, guys. Until next time, bye.